like to begin with a song, and this is kind of a theme song that we sing, and Lydia will be leading us. song together. Um, I'll sing it for you so that you kind of know what it sounds like. I'll sing the first verse and then we'll all sing it together. Um, so it goes like this. Good news, good news, Christ died for me. Good news, good news, if I believe. Good news, good news, I'm saved eternally. That's wonderful. Extra good news. So let's sing this song together, okay? <laughs> good news, good news, Christ died for me. Good news, good news, if I believe. Good news, good news, I'm saved eternally. That's wonderful, extra good news. Good news, good, good news, Christ lives for me. Good news, good news. Praise for me. His word tells that he'll come again for me. That's wonderful. Extra good news. And that is extra good news, isn't it? Amen. This is kind of our theme song. Well, it's not kind of. It's our theme song that we use for our good news clubs. And that song has been around, I don't know how long. Might have been since 1937, but. I think it's not quite that old, but I can remember doing some training uh, for team member training like this at a, another church, Oakwoods Baptist, you're probably familiar with it, and we were doing a training there, and there was a gentleman sitting in the back, and we were talking about this song, we said, have anybody ever heard of this song before? And he raised his hand, and I said, you've heard of this song? Because nobody down here back you know, 10, 15 years ago, knew about CEF, I didn't think. And he said, yes, I know this song. And I said, oh yeah, sing it. And he sang the whole song. I said, where did you learn that song? He said, well, I came from, I believe it was Ohio. They had a Bible club in backyard, and that's the song that they would sing. And it's amazing. He hasn't heard that song for years, but yet he remembered it. Put words, strong doctrine, into music, and it'll be remembered forever. Forever. Likewise, put other things into music, and it will also be remembered and acted out. That's the danger we have. That's why it's so important to use the music not only as an in transition from one a section of the Good News Club to another, but the music that we use is doctrinally sound, doctrinally teaching, and pertains to what you're going to be doing either in the previous session or in the next session for the Good News Club. So it's kind of neat to be doing that. So this session is called Foundations for Life. And uh, we, the children, we need to teach them God's Word. Because if you hide God's Word in your heart, uh, you will not sin against Him. You know, we need to have God's Word put into their heart. But sometimes that's very difficult to do. I'm going to give you an example of what not to do. And you are all children in my Sunday school class. Are you ready? Imagine that you're children in my Sunday school class. Boys and girls, it is so good to see you this morning. Oh, you look so nice and fresh and everything. I am so excited because I have a new Bible verse I want to teach you this morning. Are you ready to learn it? Yeah. yeah, all right. And the Bible verse is in Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter 53, verse 6. And in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isn't that a great verse, boys and girls? Yeah, it's a great, it sure does explain about us, doesn't it? 
Yeah. So let's all try to say this verse together. I'll say a few words and you repeat what I say, okay? Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, boys and girls, it's very, very important that you remember this verse and you memorize it. And to memorize it, you have to repeat it over and over and over and over and over again. We can't do that in the class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out a sheet of paper that has this verse on it. How many of you promise that you will read that verse every day? How many of you will promise? Well, you, all, you, all, you won't disappoint me now, will you? Right? You'll, you'll, promise, you'll promise you'll do that. Okay. So when you leave today... Uh, in the, the bag of candy we got for you, there's also this paper, and you said, you promised me, that you would hang it up on your fridge or whatever you use the most of. Most of you probably the fridge or the cookie jar. Okay? So you put it there and you read it. Read it every day and then come back next week and tell me this verse. Okay? Will you remember that? Will you do that? Oh, uh, you'll make me proud if you do. Remember, it's Isaiah 53, 6. <coughs> well, how time flies. A whole week went past. Man, just like that, a vapor. So, here we are back in the Sunday school class. And same teacher, same children. And here we go. You ready? Boys and girls, remember our Bible verse from last week? Yeah, it was Isaiah 53, 6. How many of you read it every day this week? <laughs> See, we've got one that said that she would read it, and she did. She's made me pretty proud. Yeah, but the rest of you, what happened? You really disappointed me. You said that you would read it, Memorize it and tell me that verse this week. I am so disappointed. So who would like to stand up and read that verse to me from memory? Besides you, let's give somebody else a chance. How about Johnny back in the back of the room there? John, Johnny, c can you do that? And, and, you know, there's always one guy, right? There's always one girl. <coughs> anyway... Johnny, come on, Johnny, come on up here, up front, and, and recite Isaiah 53, 6 for me. You know, boys and girls, he did what he said you, he would do. You didn't, but that's okay. But let me you know you kind of failed me. So come on, Johnny, read Isaiah 53, 6. Okay? Okay. I, Isaiah 53. 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone to Australia. <laughs> what a crazy example, isn't it, of how not to teach a Bible verse? I mean, what were we teaching? We weren't teaching anything. We were teaching that you had to make me happy in order to, 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 for me to give you praise. And that you could easily disappoint me. Oh, what, what burden that puts on the child, doesn't it? I mean, it, uh, do you think using those words kind of forces the child to study something, but what are they doing? They're just studying it. They're just memorizing it. It's like how many of you have ever taken an exam and you crammed for three days to take this exam? And you take the exam, I mean, you studied for three days, three solid days. You were ready. You sat down. You took the test. The test was over. You walk out of the room. And what happens to everything that you crammed in there? Yeah, gone. It's gone. So what good did it do you? We got to look at it as, you know, 
The test isn't to know how much you know at that point in time, it's how much you've learned. Big difference. Big difference. You know, well, Johnny could have, and I'm going to pick on Johnny, I'm glad there's none here, but uh, little Johnny, I mean, he memorized what he thought was the scripture, but uh, there was something wrong. And what was something wrong was he had it up here, but not here, and he didn't even have it up here right because he didn't understand the words that were being memorized or taught. And we need, in, uh, in teaching God's Word, we need to make sure they understand what they're learning and how to teach it to them. Of course, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7 is the command. And it says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. What commands? All the commandments that God gave the children of Israel. And he said, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. So does that sound like we're only supposed to teach our children at Sunday school? Uh, how about, uh, you know, Wednesday night? How about in the good news clubs? Uh, how about, well, no, it, it means we're to be teaching them all the time, aren't we? Uh, you know, parents, grandparents, uh, we're, we're to be teaching our children all the time about God's commands and God's statutes and who God is. And that comes from when, when they're a little baby, you start teaching. And what's interesting is that's a command from God to us to do. But we serve such a fantastic God. When he gives a command, he helps provisions us to do that and follow out that command. And he instilled something in the life of a child that helps us to fulfill this command. You know what it is? What drives you nuts when you're with your children? Asking questions. That's right. God instilled it in the child to ask questions. It used to drive me nuts. You know, my daughters, that we'd be walking out and they'd go, Daddy, why is the sky blue? Uh, why are the clouds white? Why is the grass green? Why is the... Oh, uh, uh, I, uh, I pulled all my hair out. Well, almost all of it. Well, what I didn't realize, and then I realized later on, that that was what God instilled in them so that I could be obedient to his command. When I realized that, then I was able to use that and explain, God created this. God made this. Do you remember on day such and such when God, God's word says that he created this? And this is how he created it. And, and then you could explain, you could teach God's word to them. Oh, sure, a little bit at a time. But you could teach God's Word so that it went from here to here and more importantly, to there and the walk in their life. That's what's so great about God's Word. Uh, Morning, Milford Morningstar wrote this. She was a children's writer. She said, in this changing world, we need something in which to cling. Something which is sure steadfast something which never changes that could be better than the, what could be better than the sure the sure sure word of God think about that you're gonna be teaching things to these children that will never change you know they don't get that in school and I'm, I'm not saying this to put school down or to put teachers down but who ever heard of a history book being rewritten Excuse me, it's already done. Whoever heard? Why do we keep doing new math books? Excuse me. Does one and one still equal two? Ah, some don't believe that. God's word, though, never changes. And that's what you're teaching. That's what we will be teaching to the children. But again, they have to have it here. They have to have it here they have to have it here 
and they have to have it in their feet in order to build their life on it. I gave you some, memory, or some verses to a few people on yellow cards, and I would like you to look them up, and if you could, read them when I ask you to read them, okay? And what this session is going to do is it's going to be the work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at these verses and see how the Spirit, Holy Spirit can use this verse in the life of us or in the life of the child, okay? So the first verse that we want to, to talk, <laughs> to, um, to hear and to listen to is 1 Peter 1.23. Okay, how can the Holy Spirit use that verse? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, so that was the first time we were born, but of incorruptible, that's when we were born from above, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, you've got some notes in that folder, and the notes are, uh, of course, for this class. You'll have... Uh, the class would be called Foundations for Life. You have in the notes area uh, several verses, that, the verses that we're going to be reading, and then there's a little block off to the side with choices. So kind of like a multiple choice thing, almost. So how do you think the Holy Spirit could use this verse in the life of a child? It no, uh, draws the unsaved to Christ. That's correct. The unsaved. Being born again. Uh, being born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. <coughs> Let's uh, look at Psalm 119.9. How do you think the Holy Spirit could use that verse in the life of a child or adult? Helps in our Christian living, doesn't it? Helps in our Christian living. Cleanse the way. Cleanse your way. You know, we're going to get spiritually dirty in our path, in our walk. Not because we want to, but because of our sin nature in us and because of the world around us. And we need to draw into God's Word to be cleansed. And of course, again, 1 John 1, 9 says we need to confess to cleanse ourselves uh, or to have ourselves cleansed by God. How about 1 Peter 3.15? How about that verse? How can the Holy Spirit use that one? To witness. That was pretty easy, wasn't it? But mm, it's easy to see it. It's not easy to do it. And it's interesting. People today will always be ready to give you an answer for everything. But the verse at the end says, with meekness and fear. Fear of who? Not the person in front of you. But fear, that means a reverence, reverence to God. And uh, that's the kind of reply that we need to do. And that's our witness. How about Isaiah 26.3? We'll How can the Lord use that? The Holy Spirit use that in the life. Ah, comfort, that's correct. To comfort troubled hearts. Do you think the children that you will be having in the Good News Club, I mean, they're only, they're about this tall to about, mm, they might be about that tall. Do you think they're going to have need comfort? Do you think they have troubled lives? Oh, they haven't learned, lived very much. But yeah, they do, don't they? In fact, the children are going through a lot more today than we ever had to go through. When I was growing up, there was a pot on the stove cooking all the time. It had greens, it had ham, it had beans, it had ham. And, you know, I knew I'd go to that. Yeah, 
cornbread in the oven. Okay, here we go. I'm getting hungry. Bring on lunch. Now, uh, that, you know, today, though, there's the pot cooking all the time, too. But it's not beans and it's not greens. It's meth. Yeah. And it's sad. Yeah. It's sad. Next verse is uh, Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine. 29. 2229. What do you think the Holy Spirit shows a child that verse? Unsound doctrine. Do you think they're going to confront unsound doctrine in school? In their life? On TV? On their video games, they are being bombarded with unsound doctrine. As Jesus said, <laughs> he told the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the ones that should have known, he said, You do err not knowing Scripture. That's crazy. They were the ones that knew it. They knew it, but they didn't know it. Huh. So sad. How about the last one? Psalm 119, 171. Psalm 119, 171. My lips shall utter praise, for thou hast taught me thy And? Praise, that's right. The only word left. Praise. Do you think children need to learn how to praise God? Do you think some adults need to learn how to praise God? Yeah, really. Uh, I, I agree with that. I think we need to learn how to, to praise God and to, to be together as a group of people and just give glory to Him for all that He has done. I mean, now we know how God can use His Word uh, in order to, to help in the lives of us and of the children. But again, in order for that to happen, it has to be here. Hiding God's word in my heart, as David says. And it has to be to your feet in the application of it. But how do we get it from here to here into there? Well, that is what Lydia is going to come up and continue in the teaching of it. I'll give you a minute and I'll give you a mic. Would you like a mic? introduce myself for a minute because you've gotten to know Tom and Marcia but not really me very much. Um, so if you haven't guessed already, Tom and Marcia are my grandparents. Um, but uh, yes, I am related to them but I also work with them as well. So we kind of partners in this ministry together. I am very young as you can tell. I'm 18 years old. I wouldn't consider it that young. But I am still in school. I'm a senior in high school, but I also do dual enrollment at the community college. Um, I plan on going into education, so that's also very exciting. But I've been in this ministry for, working with this ministry for two years now, but I've been a part of this ministry since I can remember. I've been teaching since I was 11, um, but yes, so I've been in a part of this ministry for a very long time, so I do have experience in teaching and other sorts of things. So we are going to get into how to teach a memory verse. Now there are quite a few steps and there is a method that CEF uses that I'm going to teach you today so you, you can learn how to use this in your own club. And this is, is it up there? No. And this is called the I-Pair method. So I-P-E-A-R. And we're gonna basically go through each step. So the first part is the introduction. So 
most people, when they tend to start teaching a memory verse, they just want to jump in right away and get straight into the memory verse. But you need an introduction. You need something to grab the children's attention because you want their eyes up here. Okay? Something to grab their attention, something that relates to the memory verse. Um, so these could be examples of an object lesson, something to get them thinking about. Or maybe it could be showing a picture or asking them a question. If the verse is from Genesis 1-1, you can show them a picture of animals or you can ask them a question, what was your favorite thing that God made? Something like that. Um, another fun thing that children love in Good News Club is puppets. And this is Pop-Up Puppy. And we use him uh, to play games, but we also use him for introductions. And it's just a fun way to incorporate puppets. And so if you have a bunch of younger children in your club, which you'll find out within the first two to three weeks how many children and uh, what age group you have, um, what the major age group you have in your Good News Club is, but puppets work really well for those younger children, even the older ones too. And a lot of times they like to come up and help with the puppet as well. So he's really fun. We might use him today uh, when we do the demo. So after you've introduced it, you're going to go straight into the memory verse, and you're going to say the memory verse with the children, but you're also going to present it to them. You're going to present it to them by showing them the picture, but then you're also going to use something very important. You're going to use your Bible. You're going to read it directly from God's Word. Because even though you're reading it up on the, on the visual, you want to show that this verse truly comes from God's Word. So they need to see you looking down at your Bible, reading it directly from God's Word. And you need to show them where to find it in God's Word as well. Okay? That is really important. I always recommend that you please bring your hard copy of God's Word to Good News Club every week. Even if you're not the memory verse teacher, or even if you're not even teaching anything at all. You're all counselors. If you have a child come up to you and ask you questions, you need to be ready. You need to be prepared. You need to have God's word with you so that you can show them that this is not just me saying it. This is God. God's saying this. That's why you need God's word. Now, I know that technology is very big nowadays. And reading it from your phone, it's, uh, phones are so nice for this, that you can just whip them out at any time. And yes, I can show you from God's word. But when a child sees a cell phone, what do they think of? They think of games. They think of YouTube. My younger brothers love to watch Minecraft YouTube videos all day long. Like, that's their favorite thing. They love that. But when they see this cell phone, they see it as, oh, you're distracted. You're not here for me. So you need to put this away, is what I'm saying. I love technology and how we're able, I'm not putting technology down, I love how we're able to just pull this out at any time and when we're ministering to someone, when we're sharing the gospel with them, we can show them from God's word even if we don't have our Bible with them, but in Good News Club, you need to have your Bible with you, that is a priority. So I wanted to make that clear. Also, yes, we establish it from God's word, we read it from the visual, and we read it directly from God's word as well. Okay, And then, of course, you also teach the reference, or as known as the address, in the scripture. So in this memory verse over here, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And you can show them exactly where it comes from, from God's word, because you will have children, you will have children in your Good News Club that have grown up in church all their lives. And they know exactly how, to, how the Bible works and how you can find things in God's word. But you'll have kids who've never even seen a Bible before. And a Bible is not like a regular book. There's multiple books and different chapters and verses with inside those chapters. And there's so many different parts and it's so complex. So you need to teach that to them. They need, to, they need help understanding that. So we like to use this visual that has the Old Testament and the New Testament books on it. You can help them. It helps them visualize, oh yeah, okay, this is what the Bible, this is how it's split up. And so we like to use this to help them understand it just a little bit better, okay? But as you're teaching the, the reference, you'll also teach about the person that wrote it. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, you'll talk about Paul, who he was, 
and why he wrote this book. Why did he write this book? Okay. And then the next part, as we move on from the presentation, you will go into the explanation. Explanation is so important. You need to learn to explain it on the child's level. Because if you use huge words, they're not going to be able to understand that. They don't know what you're talking about. You need to get on their level. Words that they'll be able to understand in their language, sort of say. Okay? Um, I'll give you an example. When I was in first or second grade, I was in a Sunday school classroom. And I love my Sunday school teacher. I loved her very, very much. And, but there was one day in Sunday school, we had extra time, which was rare. It was a rare thing to have extra time in Sunday school because it all goes very quickly. And we, she said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. And at the end of the song, uh, if you have any questions about what the song means, uh, you can ask me. And so, of course, we sang the song. And at the end, I was like the only one that asked a question. And I said, I said, Miss Mary, what does it mean that we are weak and he is strong? What does that mean? And she looked at me. She looked down at me and she's like, well, it means we are weak and he is strong. I, I, I couldn't, I didn't understand it and she couldn't explain it on my level. And so it's so important to be able to have the children understand what it means, even in a song. That's why we explain songs the way we do, because we don't want them just listening and, and singing the song. We want them to understand what they're singing as well. So same concept goes for the memory verse. Um, it also says in your notes, if the verse comes up in scripture portion that you will teach, be careful not to give away the part of the lesson that as you explain the verse. So sometimes... The verse uh, does come up in the lesson, like the, throughout, you'll, talk, you'll start talking about the lesson. I know like sometimes in the Christmas lessons, the song, the, ver the memory verse is uh, almost exactly what you'll be going over in the Christmas lesson. So just make sure you don't give away what the Bible lesson teacher is going to be teaching that day. Just to, as something else to remember, keep in the back of your mind. All right, so now that you've presented it, you've talked about this memory verse, you've explained it, now the children kind of understand what's going on. You've been saying the memory verse. What do you do now? You need to apply it. They don't need to just know it up here, but they need to know it in their heart. They need to know it. And so they need some way to apply it to themselves as a child of God and also as a non-believer. So there will be two people groups that you will apply this to. It's not a boy and girl. It's not black or white people. It's not different ethnicities. It's the saved and the unsaved child. Those are the only two people groups. And so that's who you'll be applying it to. You'll point them out. You'll say, if you have believed in Jesus, this verse is a promise for you. Or this verse is telling you to go out and share the gospel with your friends, to be a witness. And then you'll also call out the unsaved child. You'll say, if you have not believed in Jesus, you can believe in him today. And you can give them the option to go and talk to one of the leaders, or if they have questions that they can go and see one of them, talk to anyone that they feel comfortable talking to. Okay? So this just gives them a personal application to apply it to themselves. Okay? Now, after you have applied it, you've gone through all these steps. The final step is repetition and review. So you'll repeat this song a lot of times, the, not song, the memory verse, with a fun game that the children love. And games are just a great way to be able to get that memory verse stuck in their head, which is what we want. We want it to get stuck in their head. And so you have some examples of games. I won't go all through these. You'll see an example in just a minute of how a memory verse is taught. But there are a few examples there, some fun examples that children do love to do because I have done these in my club before, and they absolutely love them. So, um, and then, of course, it gives you some recommendations on how to review it throughout the year. You can bring it back up into club the next week, and you can try to remember to bring it back up throughout the unit as well. 
And I remember, I don't know if you remember, but yesterday when Marsha was talking about policies and procedures, and you're in the bathroom line, and you have nothing to do with those children. They're just standing there waiting to go to the bathroom. You can say the memory verse with them there. Remember our memory verse last week? You can say it with them. So those are just some examples on how to continue keeping the memory verse alive throughout the Good News Club. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to pass these focus questions out, and I'm going to demo a memory verse for you so that you know, kind of understand what a memory verse would look like in a Good News Club. And as these are being passed out, as I'm doing the demo, um, you're going to fill out these questions. And they're pretty simple questions. Hopefully, you'll be able to understand them. If you have any questions, please ask me. But the first question is, using the iPair method in teaching the memory verse, how did the introduction relate to the life of the child? Okay. And then number two is, what was one important tool that was used in the presentation of the iPair method for the teaching of the memory verse? Okay. And then number three is, in the explanation used in the teaching of the memory verse, what concepts or truths were emphasized? Okay. And then in the teaching of the application in the memory verse, how were the two people groups addressed, and what was the application to teach one of them? Okay. Ms. Marsha changed that one. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, where in the teaching of the memory verse was the repetition of the I pair method used and then emphasized? Okay. Any questions about that? Any of those questions? All right. So, we are going to go into the demo of the memory verse. And I just want to say, y'all are going to be well behaved children in Good News Club once again. Okay? Um, hopefully, I can get it all together. got to get into my teacher mode here. Okay. All right, boys and girls, I want you just to imagine in your head, all right, you had gotten into some big trouble with your parents. Maybe you disobeyed them or you did something wrong and you were going to be punished for it. Your parents were going to either put you in time out or they were going to give you some type of big punishment. Okay? Now imagine if your brother or sister or your mom or your dad came in and said, you know what? I love you so much, and I don't want to have to see you go through that punishment. So I'm going to take your place, and I'm going to take the punishment that you deserve, but I'm going to take it for you. Now, has that ever happened to you before? <laughs> Probably not. I know it's definitely not happened to me. But in our memory verse today, it talks about someone who took the punishment for you, the ultimate punishment. He was a sacrifice for you, and his name was Jesus. So let's read this verse together and find out what this verse is. So what we do when we read our memory verses, we start in the reference on the bottom, then we say the verse, and then we say the reference again, and then with the reference, okay? So, 1 Corinthians, let's say it together, 15, 3, and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Very good, yes. So, we need to talk about this verse. Now, this verse isn't just here written up on paper. This verse comes from God's Word. God's Word, it's called the Bible. The Bible is a big book. It's made up of 66 different books. Can you imagine holding 66 books just in the palm of your hand? Isn't that amazing? Now, the Bible is split up into two parts, the Old Testament in the New Testament. Now, we need to learn how to find this verse from God's Word before we read it out of God's Word. And so, we need to find out what part the book 1 Corinthians comes from. Can anybody take a guess where it might come from? Is it in the Old Testament 
or the New Testament? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yes. We're New Testament. Very good. Good guess. So, it does come from the New Testament. And so, let me see if I can find 1 Corinthians on here. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. That is where our book comes from today, in 1 Corinthians. Okay? So, 1 Corinthians, now, there are some numbers here, quite a few numbers. The number 15 is the first number. Now, the first number always represents the chapter. So, if I go to 1 Corinthians in my Bible, I'm already there, I have it bookmarked, and then I go, it's always going to be the bigger numbers in your Bible. So, I'm going to go to the biggest number, which is 15, and I'm going to go to chapter 15. And then, the verse is the three and four. So we're actually reading two verses. So that's going to be the really, really small numbers in your Bible, okay? So I'm going to follow along down to verses three and four. Now that we have found it in God's Word, I'm going to read it out of the Bible. But what I want you to do is I want you to follow along as I'm reading it, okay? I'm going to be turned around, and I'm not going to be able to see this visual, okay? I'm just going to read it directly from God's Word, and I want you to follow along, and if I got it right, when I turn back around, I want you to give me a big thumbs up and go, ding, 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 but if I get it wrong, I want you to give me a big X and go, eh. so let's practice that together. You ready? What do we do? We go, ding, 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 and then if I get it wrong, we go, eh. okay, so let's try this. Okay, 1 Corinthians, you following along? 1 Corinthians 15, 3, and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Did I get it right? Good. Okay. So now we know that this verse comes from God's word. So let's say it all together again. Ready? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Very good. So let's talk about what this verse means for a little bit, okay? So it says, for I delivered unto you first of all. Now the person that wrote this book, his name was Paul. And Paul wrote a lot of books in the New, Test- in the New Testament. He made up the majority of the New Testament. But Paul is saying, this message is so important. And so I am delivering this message to you, that which I have received. I'm giving it to you because this is so important. So he's delivering it to you. It says how that Christ, Christ is another name for Jesus. You know, sometimes we have nicknames and people try to call us, you know. But Jesus, he had many nicknames in the Bible. He was called Savior, Master, Messiah. He's called Christ in this verse, okay? So that's who who it's talking about how that Christ died for our sins. Boys and girls, do you remember what sin is? Let's do our definition for sin together. Sin is anything that you think, say, or do that does not please God. Christ, he died for our sins. He willingly took the punishment for you and for me. People, evil, wicked men took Jesus and they placed him on a cross. They put nails in his wrists and in his feet, and he shed his perfect blood for you. But that's not the end. Let's keep on reading. What does it say? How that according to the scriptures. Now, this is just Paul. This is Paul again. He's just saying, this is exactly what the Old Testament, what the Old Testament was saying before the New Testament. This is exactly what they were saying was going to happen, and it happened. And then it says, and that he was buried. So when Jesus died, he was placed in a tomb. His friends, they took him off the cross and placed him in a tomb. And then, and that he rose again. It says that he 
came back to life. This proved that he truly was the Son of God, that he really was who he said he was. Isn't that amazing? And then it says, according to the scriptures again, just as it said was going to happen, it happened. So now Jesus is alive. He was seen by so many people, by his disciples, and it said he was seen by over 500 people. And then he went back up into heaven to live with his father, and that's where he is now. If you have believed in Jesus, this verse is a promise for you so that you can know, not only in your head, but in your heart, that Jesus, he's alive, and that he died on the cross for you. And if you've not believed in Jesus, well, you can believe in him today. You can believe that he died on the cross for you, and that he came back to life, just as the Bible said he would. Okay? So, let's read this verse one more time together, and then we're going to play a game. Okay? All right. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Very good. So, I have a little friend here. His name is Papa Puppy. And Papa Puppy loves to play games. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a volunteer to come up, and they're going to lead the group. And as we are saying the verse, you guys are going to follow Papa Puppy. Now, Papa Puppy can do many different things. He can sit. He can stand up. He can turn around. And then he can also bobble. So we're going to have to do all these things with Papa Puppy. Now, who, I'm going to do it first, and then we'll have a volunteer come up and do it. Okay? Does that sound good? So we're going to start out standing up because Papa Puppy is standing up. So I need everyone to stand up. And as we're saying the verse, we're going to follow Papa Puppy. Do you think you can do both things at the same time? I think you can. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you... First of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Very good. All right. Now, who would like to come up and coordinate Papa Puppy for me? All right. Esther, you want to do it? All right. Great. All right. So, we're going to follow Esther and Papa Puppy. Are you guys ready? We're going to start. Have them sit down. Yeah, we're going to start sitting down. Okay. You ready? First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Very good. All right, I'm going to have one more volunteer come up and help me coordinate Papa Puppy. All right, come on up, Jessica. All right, are you guys ready? One more time. Okay, we're going to start out sitting down. Does that have Papa Puppy? Yes, very good. All right, ready? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Very good. Thank you, Jessica. All right. So, I know that was a lot, and that was a very active game, but the children do love that game very much, and 
you'll be surprised at how many children will like to come up here and just coordinate Papa Puppy the way they do. And they'll make it go very fast. Like they'll, they'll make him go very fast. So you may need to like give directions on how fast Papa Puppy needs to go because real people can't go that fast. Okay, so let's go over the focus questions first and then we'll move on. Okay, so the first question was, using the iPair method in the teaching of the memory verse, how did the introduction relate to the life of the child? What was done in the introduction? Right, yes, had them imagine someone taking the punishment for them. Very good. And did that relate to the verse? Yes, it did, okay? All right, what was one important tool that was used in the presentation of the I pair method for the teaching of the memory verse? The Bible, very good, yes. All right, in the explanation used in the teaching of the memory verse, what concepts or truths were emphasized? What was explained? What were some different concepts that were explained? Very good, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good, yes. So there were a bunch, there was a ton that was explained, right? Like even just in the smallest things, like the definition for sin, reemphasizing what sin was, how that who Christ is, that he's Jesus. <coughs> Lots of different things were explained. Very good. I'm glad you caught on. All right, in the teaching of the application in the memory verse, how are the two people groups addressed and what were the application to each one of them? The saved and the unsaved, right. And what was said to them? What was their application? If you are saved, it's a promise. Mm -hmm. Very good, yes, very good. And where in the teaching of the memory verse was the repetition of the I pair method used and then emphasized? What did we do at the very end? We played the game, very good, yes. And there are different examples of games that you can do in your club, depending. And you may need to change the game depending on who you have in your club, um, but yes. Okay, I'm done. Three minute break. No. Three question song. Oh. oh, three question song. I was like, <laughs> normally we do break, okay. And I three hope your knees We'll be covered after today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Three questions. I'm trying to remember what my introduction was for this. Okay. I've got it now. I, I remember. Okay. Again, we're in Good News Club. Well-behaved children. So, how many of you like to read? Raise your hand. I kind of like to read. I'm not a huge reader. But have you ever been reading something, maybe for school or maybe even just for fun? and you're reading the page and all of a sudden your mind goes wandering somewhere else. And then you realize once you get halfway, once you get down the entire page, you're like, what in the world did I just read? And then you have to go back and you have to read it all over again. Well, has that ever happened to you? Yes, I know it's definitely happened to me. Well, God doesn't want us to do that when we're reading his word. Did you know that? He doesn't want us to do that at all. And so in this song, it teaches us three things we can ask ourselves as we're reading God's Word. And it's, as I read God's Word each day, I will ask myself three questions. What does it say? So what is God's Word saying? What does it mean? What are the words, what do those words mean? And what is God saying to me? Okay? So I'm going to sing this song for you, and then we'll talk about what it means. Okay? So it goes like this. As I read God's word each day, I will ask myself three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? What is God saying to me? I will ask God's Holy Spirit who lives in my heart to show me the answers clearly so I'll know God's message to me. All right. So this verse is basically just talking about if you read God's word, you need to ask yourself these questions. If you have believed in Jesus, God wants you to read his word. He wants you to read it every single day. And I know that can be hard sometimes, but God can always help you to remember to read his word and to ask yourself these questions. And if you have not believed in Jesus, well, you can believe in him today. So let's stand up and let's sing this song together with the music. Hopefully it works. As 
confession is drawing in what we call drawing in the net. Drawing in the net. Because we're all supposed to be fishers of men. But before we begin, I'd like to have Lydia come up and sing a song for us. With us. And to us. Okay. Do any of you have any fears? Like, are you afraid of something? I know I am. Okay, I have a big fear of heights. I always have, from a very young child age, I've avoided roller coasters my entire life. I've avoided uh, trying not to go on zip lines or rope courses or anything like that, even though my siblings try to force me to. Um, but I have some fears of heights. And there are some fears that you might have as well. But did you know that even when we're scared or afraid, and the world seems kind of scary, or even when we're happy, did you know that we can go to God and talk to him about that? And that's what our song talks about today. Our song is called, I Look to You. And the song says, when the world around me is scary and I don't know what to do, when I don't know what is coming, I remember what is true. And it says, I look to you. Now, when you look to God, that is just through prayer. Now, if you have believed in Jesus, God wants you to pray to him every day. God wants you to talk to him at any time. Did you know that God is always available? You know, sometimes we have friends that aren't really available at all times, but God is. He's always available, and you can talk to him at any time, any time. If you have not believed in Jesus, well, you can believe in him today. I'm going to sing this song for you just a little bit, and then we'll all sing it together. Now, in this song, there is a repetition part. That just means that I'll sing a part, and then you'll sing it after me. So this part goes, you say, I will never leave you, and then you'll say, I will never leave you, and then I'll say, the Lord is my helper, the Lord is my helper, and then we'll go right into the song. So this song is very easy to pick up, so why don't we all just stand up, and we'll sing it together. When the world around me is scary And I don't know what to do When I don't know what is coming I remember what is true I look to you I look to you You give me peace You give me joy You give me hope when I am hopeless You remind me that I song, I look to you. Notice the, the promises of God that we taught yesterday, right into the song so that the children will always remember, Jesus promised, I will never leave you. I will never leave you. But in order for him to fulfill his promise, it requires something else from the child, from the people. Uh, we need to have him and accept him as our personal savior. And that's why we're doing this session with drawing in the net. You know, God invites the child to come to him. We've already talked about that in Mark chapter 10, verse 14. And Jesus saw the disciples shooing away the children, so to speak, uh, when they came to see him. And it says 
And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, that's to his disciples, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. What's the reason why to give an invitation? It's because it gives us an opportunity to counsel the child. Or to counsel, well, the count, we'll talk just child. But when I say child, remember it's also adults that I'm talking about. But it gives the opportunity to counsel the, the child to make sure uh, they know what they are doing. And uh, for us to make sure we know what they have done. And so it gives us that chance in counseling. There's principles to it. Uh, and the first principle is that we should be praying and expecting the Holy Spirit to be convicting of sin. Convicting them of sin. You know, uh, it's interesting God's Word tells us that His Word will not return, what? Boy. Boy. So, but yet when we are giving out God's Word, we're sometimes surprised when, when people react to it. Oh, wow, that's pretty neat. Well, God tells us that we are to expect that, are we not? And if we don't get it, hmm, is making God a liar? Or are we not putting out God's Word clear enough and precise enough? So that's something that we need to take into consideration. But God says that when his word goes out, something's going to happen. And again, you're going to be able to see what is happening. That's one of the great advantages of a pastor being up here looking at you when he is giving a message. He can see you squirm. He can see you... He can see you daydreaming. He can see you texting. <laughs> he can see the Holy Spirit working. He can see. And that's kind of, it's fun. You're going to see the same thing. Uh, and always be ready and prayed up before the club, by the way. Uh, because you're going to need him. Uh, if you're going to use audio visuals like we use here, uh, Expect your teenies not to work. What are you going to do? Are you going to go nuts? Or are you just going to work your way through it? Somehow we'll get through this. Never be dependent on something man-made. Always be dependent on God. Always. So we're to give an invitation every class, every good news club. Every service should have an invitation of some type. Every Sunday school class. Every Wednesday night teaching should have some type of an invitation. Why? You say, wow, that's kind of overdoing it, isn't it, Tom? Uh, no, not if you're putting out God's word. You should be expecting something, some kind of a challenge. And we need to give that invitation. Remember, the invitation isn't so we can count, oh, good, we've got this many. I mean, it's nice to have numbers, but that's not what we're in it for. It's not the numbers. It's to change the hearts, to help change the hearts by giving out God's word and seeing what that does. Whether it be to have someone accept Christ as their Savior or whether it be to help them to learn how to grow with Christ, what they have already, who they have already accepted. The principles in giving an a invitation, keep it brief. Keep it brief. For an example, an invitation would be given perhaps after the Bible lesson time. The Bible lesson time between 15 and 20 minutes. So you've already went through all the Bible lesson. When you give the invitation, you don't need to rehash everything you just talked about in the last 20 minutes. You just need to pick key points. Okay? So keep it brief. Then you need to make it personal. How can you make it personal? Remember how we made God's word personal to reading it? We insert the, what, the child's name in it, in that verse. That's not changing God's word. It's just making God's word more personal to me, to you, to them. And we need to make it personal by saying you. For an example, you give an invitation. You say, would anyone like to? Or would you like to? 
See the difference? It's a big difference. One generic, one specific and personal. We need to make it voluntary. You say, well, of course it's going to be voluntary. I'd never force anyone to accept Christ as their Savior. Well, let me give you an example. Uh, we had one case a long time ago. Uh, this gentleman was giving an invitation, and uh, he knew that one of the children in that club, uh, their grandmother passed away. And he knew the grandmother, and she was a godly woman. And uh, he gave the invitation, and uh, no one responded. And he walked up to this person, I'm going to pick on Johnny again, he walked up to Johnny and said, Johnny, wouldn't you like to accept Jesus as your personal Savior? I know your grandmother just died. She was a wonderful lady. She's up in heaven. Don't you want to be with her someday? What did you just do? You forced a child, didn't you? You forced a child. And when in conviction, let the Holy Spirit be the conviction, not you. Would you like to are you telling me that you don't want to accept Jesus Christ and you would rather be uh, separated from God forever? You see how you're convicting that person or that child? We need to make it very positive and voluntary. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. Let God the Father be drawn. Us, we're just the vocal putting out God's word. It's not our responsibility to make sure someone gets saved. No, God does that. My responsibility is to give the gospel message out. That's where I need to be obedient. But we need to make it voluntary. So, one of the procedures that we use is we do it in a very quiet, reverent voice. And of course, as the example, you have scripture in front of you, the Bible in front of you. You want to give it with love and compassion. You don't want to sound strong and, and hateful or strong and mean, but you want to be reverent. This is a special time. And you're there because you love the kids. Show that love in that invitation. And use the same terms and concepts that are in your invitation verse, whichever verse you use. And there's a lot of them. Most of them are in the lesson. And you can use that. And of course, it's a, a, prom, a condition and a promise verse, like we talked about yesterday. Excuse me. And you need to read and explain that condition, promise verse. Sometimes, in, in one of the clubs, your memory verse may be an invitation verse. And then you already have a visual up there, and you can use that visual. And it has a condition and promise. Sometimes it won't be in there, and you'll need to pick your own verse, what you need, want to, to use for the condition promise. So, the condition promise first, just to review it very quickly, uh, I passed out some more cards, some different people got lucky, and uh, I'd like to have them read and then tell all of us, think about. What is the condition and the promise in that scripture verse? The first verse, John 3.16. What compassion. Thank you. What, what is the condition in that? We must do what? We must believe in him, in Jesus Christ. If we believe in him, what's God's promise? Everlasting life. You see how simple that is? See how simple? You would give an invitation, would you like to believe on Jesus Christ and what he has done for us? And God promises if you believe, we will have everlasting life with him. See how simple that is? You're having the verse, you're using the same words in the verse that you've already explained, and now you're making it into a form of a sentence that's personal. Would you like to? 
How about Acts 16.31? Acts 16.31, and he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. What's the condition for that verse? What must we do? Believe on Jesus. Now, what's the promise? If we believe on Jesus, we're saved and our house. Now, you might want to explain that. But you know what? I don't know that it needs some explanation, but you could if you want, if someone had a question about it. But you're going to see this in action. A child will get saved in your good news club. They'll go home. They'll talk about what happened. And you know, you know what's going to happen? They'll, they'll take home some material you're going to give them, Bible verses, maybe a wonder book, uh, whatever, maybe they need a Bible, or you gave them a Bible. They'll start reading it. Their parents will read with them because they're not such a good reader. And you know what's going to happen? And we had that example not too far away from here where a father and a mother, they just quit going to church. Uh, now, they were saved and accepted Christ when they were younger, but they just quit going to church. Their son came to a Bible club, a good news club, and he accepted Christ as his Savior, and he kept working on his mom and dad. Can you take me to church? He said, I need to go to a good church. I need to go to church. And finally, they said, okay, we'll go to church. So they went to church, and lo and behold, they recommitted their life to Christ. They are now members in that church. Active members. Participating, teaching in that church. That's what that means, that verse in the house. doesn't mean one person gets saved, they're all saved. But it means once a person in that house is saved, they show Jesus Christ in their life if they're taught well. How about the next verse? John 1.12, my favorite. So the condition that I must do, what must I do? Receive and believe. And if I receive and believe, what does God promise? Sons of God, I'll be a child of God, I'll be in God's family. Wow, that's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. How about Romans chapter 10, verse 13? So what must I do? Now, remember when we said children are very literal? If you use this verse and you don't explain it, you say, call on the, God, on the Lord. What is the child going to ask you? What's his phone number? What's his phone number? That's right. <laughs> children are literal. Children are literal. I used this verse when we were living in France and I had a, con well, not a contractor, but a supplier that was with an Israeli firm. And he would, uh, he would be my contact, so I was with him quite a bit. Uh, he was Jewish, and I would wish him holiday, happy Easter, uh, you know, Merry Christmas, you know. And he'd go, I don't celebrate Christmas, I know, but I just wanted to let you know, I do, and I want to wish you a merry one for you. And... Uh, <coughs> And I shared this verse with him. And he looked at me as serious as he could be. And he said, in Israel, that's a local call. Okay? In Israel, to call upon the Lord is a local call. It's not a long distance like what we He was taking it literal, just like the children do. And, of course, he was being funny, okay? Uh, but uh, I continued to witness to him. We continued to have fun and good fellowship throughout our stay there. But call upon the Lord, what does that really mean? It means to talk to God, to call on him, to, to talk with him. And it promise is that if we do, he, uh, we will be saved. And so those are really important things to, to stress. And, again, the invitation should include that Bible verse that you picked, but the same condition and the same promise 
and it needs to be explained. Okay, so the procedures for giving an invitation. One, after all that is done, you want them to close their eyes. Why don't you want them to close their eyes at the very beginning? Yeah, I mean, you can't make it very personal if they all have their eyes closed, right? So you want to make that contact. You want to see what's going on in, in the hearts and the soul of those people you're talking to. So you want to see what the Holy Spirit is doing. And it'll be like, it's kind of interesting. It's like, blink, you'll see, whoa, the light just came on. <laughs> Something's going to happen. Uh, so, but now you need them to close their eyes. Again, you want to make it personal. Now we come to that question. Would you like to believe? Would you like to receive? Would you, anything that your condition, promise, verse, uh, uh, had in, as far as words, and then ask them that question, would you like to? Keeping it personal, you, 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 you. And then separation from, God, uh, from the group. Uh, meaning, uh, if you, how are you going to know if someone wants to receive Jesus as their Savior? You want to sign somehow. You know, you say, if, if you would like to believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, show me by raising your hand. And, you know, child will raise their hand. Or show me by standing up. Or whatever phrase you want. And then you say, okay, sit down, put your hand down. After I finish praying, those that have showed me they'd like to receive Jesus as a Savior, uh, that raise their hands, meet me in the back of the room. If you're separating the group. Because the rest of the group is going to go on to do something else. Normally a game time or some, some other portion of the Good News Club. But you're going to be doing counseling. And if there's a lot of children that respond, you're going to need more people back there to counsel. That's why all of you should be able to counsel. Well, Mark's is going to talk about that in just a moment. Now, let me go back, digress a little bit, and look at that terminology that I use. Terminology is important. Remember, the children take it very literal, everything we say. What's the difference between saying, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Savior, show me by raising your hand. Or, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your personal Savior, raise your hand. What's the difference? No. I use the word show me. Big deal. What does that mean? Does it mean any difference if you leave it out? Remember little. Think little. You may want them to respond. Yeah, but you don't want them to think that by raising their hand, they accept that Christ is their Savior. So you want to say, show me by raising your hand. Do you know how many adults I talk to when I say, when did, you, when did you accept Jesus as your Savior? And they tell me, I walked the aisle when I was 15. And I said, that's really great. When did you accept Jesus as your Savior? Well, I went to the altar, when, uh, you know, and, uh, and then they would explain. But they believed walking that aisle or going to the altar was what saved them. You think, really? They really believed that? They do. You don't want the child to start out on the wrong foot by thinking wrong thoughts. I raise my hand, therefore I am saved. No. You read, they raised their hand so that you could counsel them and find out through questions what God was doing. Now there's nothing wrong with coming forward. I mean, you're, you're basically doing that when you separate them. They're not going forward, they're going backwards. <laughs> but you need to have that counseling time. But make sure the child understands it's for counseling time. If you didn't save them, they didn't save themselves. It was God and their faith that they put in Christ that saved them. So then they'll start out on the proper, proper feet, foot. I could blame them on it getting late, but it's not, is it? <laughs> okay. 
So, steps in giving the invitation. Review the need. And what, what, what is the need in the child's life that if they've never accepted Christ? <coughs> to accept him, right? Because of their sin. And then you need to review the way of Jesus Christ. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice. And then read and explain that memory, that uh, condition promise verse for the invitation that you're going to use. Make sure you explain it. Have them close their eyes and then ask for a response and then give directions. Have you noticed we have a thing with using hands and visuals? Because the more different outside effects that you can get involved in teaching, the more they'll learn. And speaking of learning, Marcia is going to come up now and give you a visual of the invitation and sample demonstration. Thank you. Okay. So I'll wait till Lydia hands out the invitation cards. If there's ever a hesitation within the team, it's usually about um, having apprehension about giving an invitation. Okay, usually it's something that they see their pastor do, and they feel that that's the only one that should give an invitation, because that's what you used to, okay? But we're all responsible to lead people, especially children, to Christ. Okay, now if, if you're a good Bible teacher, okay, and you definitely do not feel comfortable with it, it's okay to ask someone else to come up to give the invitation. So now you can all have cards, and this is your focus question card that we're going to use as well. Okay, so you're going to make sure that um, I review why uh, to give an invitation because of the need and the way to solve that to solve that need. Okay, and then I will use other. We'll be using a condition promise verse. I'll use Acts 16:31. And um, I'll ask the children to make it private by bowing their head and closing their eyes. And also, as I give um, the explanation for the verse, watch to see if I use the word you, okay? It's not, you don't want to put yourself into this. You want to know that it's going to the children, okay? So the word you is very important to us in CF. Try to use that as much as we can. Okay, and then of course to make it personal for them to bow their head and close their eyes. And then I'll ask them the question using the term, show me by, okay? And it could be raising your hand. It could be by looking up at me, okay? It could be standing up. It just, you know, whatever you choose to use, whatever you think is best for your group of children. And then I'll ask them to meet me, um, or it could be someone else if you have another function to, to you know, fulfill right, right after. But to meet you, them, the, ch the children that responded, usually I'll say like in the back of the room, okay, or at the door, um, some specific place that's close to them that's open to the public as well, okay? Boys and girls, you've heard today about the love that God has for you. And even though, boys and girls, you, you want to go your own way and not God's way, because you were born with a want to, to do that. You know what sin is. You've learned that today. And you know that you practice it. But God, because of his love for you, he gave his son, Jesus. 
And God showed his love when, he, when his son died on the cross and rose again, all because of your sin. What a wonderful, wonderful expression of love, isn't it? Boys and girls, there's this wonderful verse in, the, in God's word, God's word that is always true. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. To believe something means that you take it as your own. You own that, that thought. You own what actually happened. To believe that what Jesus did for you on the cross completely paid for your sin. And there's nothing at all that you can add to that. And when you believe that, by receiving that, by accepting that as your own, Okay, then God's word told us, thou shalt be saved. Thou is a word for you. You can be saved, saved from your sin. Well, you don't have to worry about if your sin is paid for or not because of what Jesus did for you. Boys and girls, making a decision to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior because he saves you from your sin is a very important decision that only you can make. No one else can make it for you. This is a personal decision. Right now, I want each and every one of you to close your eyes first, close your eyes everybody, and bow your head. When I see everyone doing that, I'll continue. Very good, okay? Boys and girls, if you have never received Jesus, believed on Jesus as your Savior before, and you have believed on him for the first time today, or if you would like to believe on him, but you have questions, okay, I want you to show me by simply right now raising your hand with your eyes closed and head back and you see raise your hand okay i see some hands very good okay so now boys and girls you can open your eyes and raise your head okay so if you raised your hand when i asked you to okay i want you to meet me in the back of the room at the white table and i'll be back there because I want you sh to show you more from God's word, and I want to pray with you and thank the Lord that you want to receive him as your savior. Right now I'm gonna pray, and after I pray, then you can go back to the white table. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that it's simply believing on what your son did for all these children, Lord, that they could have their sins forgiven by believing on him. Thank you for the Bible lesson today and how it showed us, Lord, of your perfect love for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, I didn't, I don't know if anybody timed me, but I'm thinking three minutes, maybe? Okay, so did I review the need and way? Did you hear it? Okay, what words do you, do you remember I used? Anybody remember? Did I use the word love? Okay. Did I use the word sin? Yes. And then, of course, what Christ did. Okay, so that was the need in the way. Did I use a Bible verse? Okay, Acts 16, 31. Did I briefly explain it? Okay. Did I ask them to make it private? By bowing their heads. And that's so important. And it's good to ask them tell them I'm not going to continue okay until I see everyone heads back okay because you don't want them doing something just because of their neighbor okay and then uh, that all important term show me by did I remember to use it oh good I'm so glad <laughs> okay and then a place to meet you can see it doesn't take long it's very simple if you use this this very simple five principles and use it in your Sunday school classes too, Wednesday night. Anything we teach here, we want it used, okay? Not just in Good News Club, okay? 
Now, okay. Um, let's see. Lydia is going to pass out guiding a child to the Savior. We're going to, I think there's, it might be short. We're going to give one to each couple, okay, and then the single. And you can make copies of these if you like. Okay, we're a little short on them today. <coughs> Okay, so when you go back to the table and the children go back, okay, the first thing you're going to ask a child is a question. Write this question down. Why did you come back to speak with me today? Okay, now you may have one child go back, you may have three, you may have ten. Okay, but most likely if you have more than three, well, it doesn't matter if you have two, they can have gone back there for different reasons, okay? And you want to know how to deal with this, each child and deal with each of them respectfully, okay? So when you ask that question, why did you come back to speak with me today? Okay, what you're doing is you are uh, performing what the emergency room calls triage, okay? So you have, you might have a couple of children that says, well, you, all different terms. They may say, well, I want to be saved. Great, okay? They may say, well, I want to know Jesus, okay? Or I want to go to heaven, okay? But there you've got um, uh, salvation concerns, okay? But let's say, I'm going to use the, the eight, number eight, and eight children come back. So you have three children that most likely either you're going to move over with another counselor, okay? Then, um, then you may have children say, well, my grandma's really sick, okay? And a couple other have similar concerns. Then you're going to give them to a second counselor, okay? And then you may have a child that says, I just want to talk to you. Okay, that's fine. That's just fine. Okay, so then either you keep them or another counselor. Do you see why you all need to be counselors? Okay, now first of all, I want to say something to you. You're not going to say the wrong thing to a child. Don't be fearful about being a counselor. I can tell you all have right hearts. You have the right concern for children. And you, I'm sure, I think your, is your pastor going to be there at the club? Yes? Okay. And you have your pastor there if you get into a situation that you don't know how to handle. But you want that child's needs um, attended to. Okay? All right. Let's go back to the three children that are concerned about salvation. Okay. So... Remember that word this book method that we taught you last night? Okay, you're going to mentally go through that and ask those children questions. Now remember, you're starting a, a new club, okay? It's been years since C.C. Wright has had a club. You don't know all the spiritual condition of the children, you don't know their family back history, whatever, but you don't need to. You really don't need to, okay? All you need to know is where their heart's at, how the Holy Spirit is working with them. So, you're going to mentally go through questions of the Wordless Book. You're not going to pull out the Wordless Book and go through it all, because they've just had it all in the Bible lesson, okay? And in other parts of the, of the Good News Club. You're going to say, like, do you know who God is? Do you know how God feels about you? Okay, gold page, right? Okay, how is God different from you? Okay, it's perfect. Okay, can you tell me why you want to be saved? Why do you need to be saved? Try to use the term that they gave you when you asked them that question about why you came back here to speak with me, okay? So then you're gonna ask them, you know, what is sin, you know? Try to, you know, try to have them share with you what, how they have sinned. And then, you know, you go to the red page. And then, finally, that white page, and you say, um, 
Ask them, ask them, have you ever believed on Jesus as your Savior before? You'll be surprised how many kids need to think they have to do it over and over again, okay? If that is true, that if they say, well, yeah, I did, I think I did that mm, in Sunday school. Okay, can you tell me when? Ask them when, okay? See if you can point at time. And if it's really vague, let them pray, okay? Make sure if they pray to receive Christ that they understand it's not the prayer, but it's their belief. See, that's why we start with a method of how to, um, how, um, I'm sorry, okay, with the word of this book on how to share the gospel, okay? So, and then also, you've got other counselors addressing the other situations, and then, okay, give them a track. If they've received Christ, then make sure you point them to one of the team members to share, probably their shepherd, okay? So, and then, share it at the end, okay? Ask that child. You know, would you like to share it before he asked the child, would you like to share it with the other kids what Jesus just did for you? And most of them would say yes. And then everybody rejoices at the end of the club. Okay? So counseling is such a joy. Okay? And then, then, if you had the opportunity to lead that child to Christ that day, write that name in your Bible and the date. Okay? That is such a blessing to do. Such a blessing. Now, I will share with you one scenario. Um that was told me. Um, she went through this process, this lady was counseling, and the child wanted to be saved, and she went through that counseling method, okay, and she says she got like, like almost to the red page, and the child says, will you please be quiet so I can just receive Jesus? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so when a child's ready, they're ready. Are there any questions at all about counseling? Just, it's such a blessing. And that's, and that's just another tool that you use to get to know the child more. Okay? Yes, and we have another handout. Um, we have clear and confusing invitations. Just take this with you. I won't go through it. But it's really interesting. It really makes you think. Okay? Um, and just ways, good ways and not so good ways, but very good ways to give an invite an invitation. Okay. So we're going to take, give us. Um, we're going to need about. Um, uh, do we need ten? We don't need ten minutes. You want a ten minute break? Yes. Okay, ten minutes. Okay, come on back here at eleven o'clock, and you get to go to a good news club. Okay. Do we have enough? Okay. Is there anybody that can get one?
Thank you.
No, I don't. Did you ask me? Just, just, just make it straight. Huh? That's all I'm asking. Just make it. Are we done with him? Yes, we are. Okay. Okay, boys and girls, welcome back. It's so good to see you. Are you happy to be here? Yeah. How was your snack time? Good? All right, that was great. Well, we are so glad to be here today. In fact, we're going to open up with a song. You probably never heard this song before, but we're going to do this song as every time we open up a good news song. And there's a portion in where it says extra, and I want you to really give it an extra because what we want is we want everybody down the hallway to know the Good News Club has started. So this lady is going to be teaching us this song called Good News. All right, let's stand up and let's sing this song together. You guys know it. Ready? Good news, good news, Christ died for me. Good news, good news, if I believe. Good news, good news, I'm saved eternally. That's wonderful, extra good news. Good news, good news, Christ lives for me. Good news, good news. He prays for me, his word tells that he'll come again for me. That's wonderful, extra good news. Good job, sit down. 
Boys and girls, do you believe that? That is extra good news? Yeah. Then why do you sing it like, good news, good news? We need to yeah. sing it so it's exciting. Yeah. Because it <laughs> is. It's exciting news. And if you don't know what the good news is, you today are going to hear what that good news is. Jesus. Boys and girls, you were so good in doing the snack time, uh, and you were really good in singing that song, Miss that for a little drink, a little bit. What I want you to do is I want you to give yourself a big hug. Can you do that? Can you give yourself a big hug? Well, do you know, boys and girls, giving this hug in sign language means love. I love you. And sometimes, you know, we have moms and dads and brothers and sisters, and sometimes some of our friends and some of the people that we're around are really hard to love. But, boys and girls, there is one that loves all and loves you so much. And that is our word up. And the one that loves us is God. So when I say, or anyone up here says, word up, I want you to repeat. God loves me. Oh, you got to say it a little bit louder and happy, because this is exciting news. Ready? Word up. God loves me. Oh, so much better. Now, we're going to have fun today. We are really going to have fun. There's a lot of things that we're going to learn. There's a lot of things that we're going to do. But first, we have to learn. we got to follow some rules. Oh, I know. Rules are Bummers, because, you know, the do's and don'ts. I follow rules all day today. But the rules that we're going to follow is called the up rules. And they're pretty simple. We call them the up rules. And you're going to find out why we call them up rules. Uh, the first rule is to sit up. Sit up in your seats. I know, boys and girls, it's been a long day for you at school. You've been sitting and you want to lounge back. You no, know, please. Sit up in your seat. The next rule that we have is to look up. That means when I'm talking or anyone's talking up here, well, we want you to look at us so that we can see you. Uh, because you, we want to see your eyes. We want to see your pretty face. We want to see you. And don't uh, look up at us. The next one is to listen up. As we're talking, uh, we want to listen. Listen to what we are saying. Uh, the next one is, if we ask a question, we want you to raise your hand. And we want you to put your hand up. And when you do that, we will call on you. And when we call on you, you can stand up. And guess what? When you do that, we will look at you, and we will listen to you of what you are saying. So we'll follow those rules, too. The last rule, rule is to zip up. That means if we haven't called on you for, to answer a question or to ask a, a, a question, then uh, zip up. I know it's hard. You're sitting next to your friends. You want to talk to them. But when you do that, it distracts the whole day. And we have really a lot of things to talk about today. So can you follow these rules? They're pretty simple. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. I have trouble following these rules. I do. And, and you know what I do? I ask God for help. And that's what I want to do now. I want to talk to God. I want to pray to God. And I want him, I, I would ask him if he would help us to follow these rules and to have a fun day today learning about him. So when I pray, what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes and I want you to listen to what I'm praying and agree with what I am asking God to do for us. Okay? Lord, we just thank you again for the privilege we have to be here. Lord, these rules that we have, they're hard to follow. And we can't do it on our own. We just ask you to give us the power to, do, to obey these rules so that we can really learn more about you. And we thank you for that. And it is in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
boys and girls, I am thinking of something. Let's see if you can guess what I'm thinking about. I'll give you a few hints. Okay, what I'm thinking about is, first hint, it's usually very shiny. Okay, and anybody know what it is yet? Not yet? Okay. Second clue is it's round. Hmm. Okay. Quarter. What is it? A quarter. A quarter? A third hint is it is made of gold. You know yet? Who says that? Raise your hand. What is it? Ring. It's a ring, yes, and this is a very special ring to me because this is the what a wedding ring, okay, and it's the symbol of the way my husband and I love each other. But you know what? We love each other very much, but there's only one person that can give you a perfect one. And that is who we're going to learn about today in our Bible verse. Our Bible verse is John 3.16. And maybe some of you already know this verse, but if you do know it, maybe I can help you learn something new about it today, okay? So the verse, we always start with the book of the Bible. Okay, it is John 3, 16. Now, this is um, a poster that we're going to use a lot in our Good News Club. It helps us to learn more about God's Word, the Bible. That is always true. Okay. Now, John is a, one of the Gospels. The Gospels tell us a lot about Jesus while he was here on earth. And so we have... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So John is the fourth gospel. It's actually the fourth book in, um, in the New Testament. Okay? And then, thank you, thank you, Mr. Tom. Okay. Then we have the next number, which is three, teaches us that it is tells us where to find it in the book of John. It's the third chapter. So all you have to do is find John in the New Testament. Is the New Testament in the front of the book of the God's Word or the back? Which one is it? Who knows? Yes. It's in the back? All right. Very good. Yes, it is. So, okay, we find the chapter. And then we're going to find the verse. It's the 16th verse. And I know all of these new 16, and I know you know the numbers, so I know each one of these in your Bible. You know what? You can bring your Bible to Good News Club every week, okay? We'd love to see you. It will help you find the memory verse every week if you need help. So, let's say this verse together. How about I'll read it first, and then you'll repeat it after me, okay? We're going to start here. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Let's do it this way. Who would like to come out here and read from my Bible? You're all so anxious, aren't you? <laughs> Aren't you, Miss Mayberry? Would you like to come on up? Okay, now, as she, come on over here so they can see the, the um, poster as well. Okay, right there. Now, you check her, okay? Make sure that, well, actually, you're not checking her. You're checking to make sure that our visual agrees with what God's Word says. Okay. Did that agree with what God's word says? Yes. 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 
Okay? Let's try that again. Let's read it. Let's, let me help her. Okay? Because sometimes, you know, your eyes do sometimes. Okay. Listen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. Does God, does the, our um, visual agree with God's word? Yes. Okay, let's give the visual a clap. Very good. All right. Well, there's so many good things in this verse, boys and girls. It says, for God. Okay? You know, God is, he is perfect. And because in his love, he says, so loved the world. I could put each one of your names right here to substitute this one word for world. Because God loves you very, very much. It's a perfect love. Don't ever doubt that, boys and girls. A perfect love, God has a perfect love for you. And how did he show us that love? That he gave, that means it's a present. You can't earn what he gives. He freely gives it to you, okay? His only begotten son. Hmm. Do we use that word begotten every day? Do we ever use that word? But you know what? Even though we don't use that word, it's a very, very important word. You know what that word tells you? It tells you that his son, who is Jesus, okay, was born in a very, very special way. The only way and he's the only one that was ever born like that. It shows us, okay, that he was born directly from his father, God. See, he didn't have an earthly father, he had a stepfather, but his father is God, okay? And it means that he is truly God's son, okay? His only begotten son, that whosoever, means everybody in this world that whosoever now that's we don't use that word either do we but it's a good word that whosoever let's say that word whosoever believe it that means that you know it's true in your heart even though it can't be proven okay even though something can't be proven you know it's true in your heart believe it in him, if you believe in Jesus, okay, that what he did for you on the cross by shedding his perfect blood pays for your sins. Believeth in him should not perish. The word perish means to be separated from God forever. Wouldn't that be awful to be separated from God forever? There's no need for that. No need for that because of what Jesus did for you but have everlasting life. Boys and girls, the second you believe on the Lord Jesus as saving you from your sin, he is with you forever and ever and ever and ever. You will never, ever be separated from him. Isn't that a wonderful gift? It is. Now, boys and girls, you see, if you have received Jesus as your savior, you know what? You have that perfect gift within you of everlasting life. It's not only that it's everlasting. Jesus gives you a new life by changing you every day as you walk with him. If you have not believed on Jesus as your Savior, this gift in this verse is here waiting for you to believe as you receive it, as you take it as your own by believing on him. Oh, boys and girls, this is a wonderful, wonderful gift in this verse. All right, let's all stand up, and we're going to learn some actions to this verse. Okay? I'm going to use my little cheat sheet here. Okay, so let's go. For God so loved the world that he gave, okay, his only begotten son, okay?
Okay, that means Jesus because he had nails in his hands when he went to the when he hung on the cross. Okay, that whosoever, okay, should not, okay, perish. Um, excuse me. That whosoever um, believeth, let's see, reach out, uh, okay, reach out, okay, and then um, and then bring it back. So you receiving it and you're bringing it back to yourself. Okay, believe it in him, okay, and then um, should not um, perish, okay, crash down with cancer, okay, okay, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Can we do that again? Okay, as we say <coughs> the verse, I'll try to remember, okay, you ready? Okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth you in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, we're going to do it again, boys and girls. Is this going to help you remember this verse? I certainly hope so. <laughs> okay? And then we're going to do it again. And then we're going to try to do it again without the words. Okay? We can do this. Okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not Marcia. I'm so worried. Why are you so worried? I got my worst subject test today. Oh my goodness. What is that? Math. Oh man. And I'm so afraid I'm going to flunk it and if I flunk it my parents won't be happy and, and I want to talk to them but they're not around here. Oh Marcia, that's, I'm so sorry. But Marcia, you know there's someone that you can always talk to. You know that, right? Really? Yes. Do you know who it is? It's God. Really? Yes. You can talk to him about any of your problems or worries, and he can give you peace and comfort through that. You know, you can talk to him through prayer at any time of the day, even when you're worried or sad, and even when you're happy. God wants you to talk to him about that. Okay, I'm going to go talk to him right now. Okay, you go do that, Marsha. All right, see, boys and girls, how Marsha, she was so nervous about her math test coming up. But you know what? You can talk to God about your worries and your troubles. And that's what our song talks about today. I look to you. It talks about when the world around us is scary. We don't know what to do. God tells us that we can look to him through prayer. If you have believed in Jesus, God wants you to talk to him at any time of the day. If you have not believed in Jesus, well, you can believe in him today. Now, let's, see, let's talk about this song right here. Now, we have a repeating part. This part, I will sing first, and then you'll repeat after me. And then I'll sing also this part, and then you will repeat after me. So Miss Marsh is going to come up and hold this visual for me. I'm going to do some motions, and I want you to just try to follow along with me. So let's stand up and sing this song together. All right. When the world around me is scary and I don't know what to do, when I don't know what 
it's coming. I remember what is true. I look to you. I look to you. You give me peace. You give me joy. You give me hope when I am hopeless. You remind me that I am yours. When I look to you. and girls. So I have this book with me here, and I'm going to flip through all these pages, and I want you to tell me what is so different about this book? What is so different about it? Yes, all the way in the back. But there's no words in it. What is in it, though? Yes, there's colors, many different colors. And would you believe me if I told you that this book, even though it has no words, and it has no pictures, and only colors, it tells a very, very true and special story. So today in our lesson, we are going to start out on the gold page. Now this gold color reminds me of something special, someone special and something special, and that is called heaven. Heaven is a wonderful place, a wonderful, perfect place. There is a the Bible says that there is a gold street in heaven that is like glass that you can walk on. The Bible also says that there is a pure river flowing out throughout heaven and then that there are big pearly gates. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful place? And in this place it is perfect, which means nothing wrong ever happens. And in this place, there is a person in his name is God. God lives in heaven. The Bible talks about God a lot. And it talks about the many different parts of God and who he is. But today, we're just going to talk about three parts about who God is. What I want you to know about God. Okay? The first part that I want you to know about God is that God is the creator. Can we say that together? God is the creator. God made everything that you see. He made all the plants, the animals, the trees in the sky, and the birds in the sky, not the trees in the sky. And he made all these beautiful and wonderful things. The Bible even says so in God's word. In the very first verse, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything that you see around you. God created all the stars in the sky. Every single star. Now, you know, there are a lot of stars in the sky. But do you know how many stars are in the sky? Do you? Not even the smartest people here on earth know how many stars are in the sky. Did you know God does? In fact, God knows the name of every single star in the sky. Can you believe that? Even my mom forgets my name sometimes. But God, he knows their names. God created everything. God even created all the animals. On the count of three, I want you to shout out your favorite animal. Are you ready? All right, one, two, three. Shout out. Wow, I heard a lot of animals all at once. But did you know God created all those animals? But out of all of these wonderful things that God created, his most special creation was you. You are his most special creation. And because you are his most special creation, he loves you very much. God created all people. 
special in their own way. Every person is unique, and they have a purpose. Maybe you've been told in your life, well, you should be grateful you're here. You were never planned. In fact, you were a mistake. Well, I'm here to tell you that God never makes mistakes, not one. You are here for a purpose. God has put you here for a purpose, and he loves you so very much. It says it in God's word in John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world. Do you live in the world? I sure hope so. I sure hope you do. This is not talking about the physical world and the things that God has made in the world, but the people in the world. That includes you and me. He's talking about you in this verse. So what's our word up? God loves me. That was a little weak. Let's try that again. Word up. God loves me. Very good. Yes, God loves you, and he wants to have a friendship with you. That's another thing that I want you to know about God, is that God loves you. Let's say that together. God loves you. Yes. He loves you with a perfect love, a love that never ends. You cannot add or take away to what God, how much God's love is for you. He loves you so very much, and I hope that you learn that today. What's our word up? God loves me. Very good. Yes. So, God loves you, and he loves all the people in the world, too. God created the very first two people, and their names were Adam and Eve. Adam was created from the dust of the ground, and God breathed life into him. Isn't that amazing? He just picked up dust from the ground and made Adam. And then God decided that Adam couldn't be alone. He needed somebody else. And so he put Adam to sleep. He performed the very first surgery. He took a rib out of Adam's side and used that rib to create the very first woman, and her name was Eve. Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with God. They were able to talk to God and walk with him. They were able to do wonderful things in the Garden of Eden. They were able to do whatever they would like. It was so wonderful. But there was one thing God had put in the garden that they were not allowed to eat, and that was the fruit. Now, Adam and Eve had all these wonderful things, all these animals, and all these plants and, and trees, wonderful things that God gave them. This is how God showed his love to them through his creation. Now, I want you to tell me, what is Adam petting right here? What is that? Yes, it's a lion. Now, tell me, if you went to a zoo today and you tried to go up into the cage and try to pet a lion, would that be the safest thing to do? No, probably not. See, Adam and Eve, they had no worries in the garden. They, had, they didn't have to worry about getting food or clothes. They didn't have to worry about being sick or unwell. They had no worries. But something happened. The world's not like that today, is it? No. We do have to worry. We have to worry about where we're going to get our food, where we're going to get our clothes. We cry. We have pain. We have sorrow. There's sickness and death in this world, all because of one thing, and that is called sin. And even though sin was brought into this world so many years ago, it affects you and me every single day. Remember, sin is anything that you think say or do that does not please God. Let's do that together. Sin is anything that you think, say, or do that does not please God. See, boys and girls, the Bible says that we are all born with a want to to sin. No one ever had to teach you how to sin. Your teacher didn't have to pull out the board and say, all right, children, this is how we're going to sin today. No, you were already born knowing in your mind how to sin. The Bible says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. 
There is not one person on this earth here that is perfect. We are all sinners, every single last one of us. That includes you, and that includes me as well. And because of our sin, because it's such a horrible thing, it needs to be punished. And the Bible talks about the punishment for sin, and that is separation from God. Now, I want you to put your hands together like this. This hand represents God, and this hand represents us. God wants us to be together because he loves us so very much, but because of our sin, it separates us from him, and we cannot be with him. You can put your hands down. So because of our sin, it separates us from him. And because sin, because of that sin, it brought destruction and sickness, pain, and even death into this world. Sin is a terrible thing. But you know what? God promised that one day he would come back and he would create a new heaven and a new earth and it would be a wonderful place to live once again. God talks about this wonderful place in the Bible and how those who have believed in him will be able to go to this wonderful place called heaven once again. Now, if you have believed in Jesus, you have a hope in what is to come. You have a hope in knowing that one day you'll get to be in heaven with God someday. Now, even though you've believed in Jesus, you're still going to sin. And there's still going to be hard times. You know why? Because we live in a sinful world with sinful people just like you and me. But even though times can be hard and times can be frustrating and very painful, we can look to God knowing that we have a hope in him. That one day you can say, you can say to yourself, God, I know, even though this world is a terrible place to live, I know that one day I'll get to be with you because I believe in you. The Bible talks about this wonderful place called heaven in Revelation, which is the very last book in the Bible. And it says this, And I heard a great voice out from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God will be there. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Imagine that. No more sickness, no more death. God will wipe away every single tear. You have a hope that one day you get to be in this wonderful place called heaven with God. Even when times seem rough, even when they seem scary, you can know that you'll get to be in this wonderful, perfect place with God. Perfect. That's another thing I want you to know about God. God is perfect. We have another word for that. That is, he is holy. Let's say that together. God is holy. Now, this doesn't mean that God has a bunch of holes in his shirt. It doesn't mean that. Holy means that God is separated from every evil and wicked thing. He is the complete opposite of that. He has done no wrong. He is, remember our definition for sin is think, say, or do. God has never thought, said, or done anything to displease God himself. He's never sinned, never did anything wrong. And because God is perfect and holy, we cannot be with him because we're sinners, because he's separated from us. But because God is perfect and holy, he decided that he was going to have a wonderful plan made just for you, just for you, so that you could be in heaven with him. And that was through his son, Jesus. Jesus came down to earth as a baby, and that's when we celebrate Christmas time. Jesus was the perfect son of God, never did a single thing wrong. He grew up, he did many miracles to prove that he was the son of God. He made the blind see, and the dead rise, and the lame walk. He did all these wonderful things to prove that he truly was the son of God. But see, people on the earth didn't believe who, that he said he was, they didn't believe him at all. And so they were jealous of him. 
they were afraid that Jesus was going to take away all their power. And so they took Jesus. But see, they didn't know that Jesus went willingly with them. Willingly. And they took Jesus and they beat him. And they placed nails in his wrists and in his feet. And they placed a crown of thorns on his head. And he shed his perfect blood for you. Remember when I said sin had to be punished? Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He took that ultimate punishment for you. And he was the only one that could do that because he was perfect. He was the only one that could do that. After Jesus died, he said, well, before he, he died, he said it was finished. He was talking about your punishment for sin. He said, it's finished. It's complete. There's nothing else that needs to be added or taken away. It is complete. You can be forgiven from your sin. After Jesus died, he was taken off the cross and he was placed in a tomb by his friends. But that wasn't the end of the story. See, Jesus, he didn't stay dead. Let's read what God's word has to say about this. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, but that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Three days later, Jesus came back to life, truly proving that he was the Son of God and that he was seen by so many people. And then he went back up into heaven to be with his Father, and that's where he is now. And that's where he wants you to be one day. Isn't that amazing? God wants you to be in heaven with him because he loves you. Now, remember when I said we are all born with that want to to sin. Remember, sin is anything, let's do this together, sin is anything that you think, say, or do that does not please God. Sin, remember, let's do this separation again. Sin separates us from him separates us from him and we cannot be with him but because God loved us he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us and to come back to life and all we have to do is believe in him and we will be saved and someday we get to be in heaven with him the Bible talks about this very thing in Acts 16 31 it says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved believe Believe just means to fully trust in what Jesus has done for you. That he died on the cross and that he came back to life. That he did it for you. And then it says that you will be saved. You will be saved from the punishment of your sin. And someday, you will get to be in heaven with him. Would you like to do that today? I would like everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. If you would like to believe in Jesus today, or if you have any questions about what it means to believe in Jesus, I would like you to show me by raising your hand. All right, you can put your hands down and look back up at me. For those of you that raised your hand, after I pray, I would like you to meet Mr. Tom in the back of the room, and he would love to talk with you more about what it means to believe in Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful day at Good News Club, and I thank you for all these children that have come to listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now for those of you that raised your hands, and if you have any questions about what it means to believe in Jesus, you can start heading to the back. But for those of you that did not, you can stay, and we are going to be singing a song. Now, do any of you like colors? I know I like colors. We have just been talking about that book with many different colors, right? Well, this song is called the Wordless Book Song, and it has all those same colors in it. Now, I know we did this. Now, I'm going to sing it for you just a little bit so that you know what it sounds like. We'll talk about what it means, and then we'll sing it all together. Sound good? Okay. So it goes like this. My heart was dark with sin until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has washed me white as snow. And in God's word, I'm told, I'll walk the streets of gold. 
to grow in Christ every day. I'll read my Bible and pray. Ooh, listen now to the story of God's love. Ooh, this is how to live in Jesus' love. New life God gave to me, life abundant and free. He wants this new life to grow, the Bible tells me so. Loving and trusting and praying, witnessing and obeying. I'll grow in knowledge and grace until I see his face. So, this song is basically talking about the entire gospel of Jesus. But let's just talk about a little bit. We'll talk about this new part here. So, if you have believed in Jesus, God wants you to grow. God wants you, this part says witness. Now, witness just means to tell others about Jesus. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to share his love with your friends, with other people. Now, if you've not believed in Jesus, this song also says that you can believe in him today and what Jesus has done for you. So let's stand up and let's sing this song together. Miss Marsh is going to help me hold it while I do the motions. And you can try to follow along if you'd like to. Okay? Are you ready? is more precious than gold. Think about that. God is perfect, and it's his, his word is perfect. So you can trust it. Now, you know, it's very interesting because many, many men wrote this. God used men to write his word. And you know what? 
they didn't even know each other. And, you know, so I did a little experiment, okay? So I, a couple of weeks ago, I took four children, and they did not know each other, okay? And, then, and I asked them to write a story, a very short story about something that they would want to write about. And so, are you interested to hear about what they wrote about, boys and girls? Are you? Okay. Okay, so this story was written. I'm not, not going to tell you the names of the children. Okay, just, just read their stories. It says here, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is who I would write about. He is very strong, so he would use his strength to save the world from all the bad guys. Okay, sounds like an interesting story, doesn't it? Okay. Then another child wrote, I wrote about Thomas Edison, how he showed us to use the electricity that God made. That'd be an interesting story, wouldn't it? You'd probably learn a lot. Then you can, oh, Abraham Lincoln, how even though he had a hard time as president of the United States, he did what was right in keeping our country together. That's an honorable story, isn't it? Okay, last one. Charles, he has a dog. His, name is, his dog's name is Ace. Ace loves to go outside. One day, Ace got out of his fence. Charles had to go find him. Charles finds Ace and all is well again. All right, four stories, but do they agree with each other? They're not even about the same thing, are they? they that's why, because they didn't talk to each other or anything. But you know what? The 40 men that God used to write his word, they all wrote one big story. And you know how long it took for the word of God to come together? 1,600 years. 40 men wrote this. Now, a few of them, okay, knew each other, but they wrote about different things about the big story of Jesus in God's word. This is the most unique Bible you have. You could ever have a unique book, but it's really not a book. You know what it is? It's a library, because there's 66 books in this Bible. Isn't that awesome? Wow, no one else could have done that but God. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, I'm working through these 40 men. That's why the Bible is so very, very important. Because God uses the Bible, what you read in it, and how he works in you to change you. To have your life be more pleasing to God. And one thing you can do, boys and girls, is, okay, every week here at Good News Club, we're going to give you a little sheet that says quiet time on it, okay? And it'll have the memory verse on it. And every day, there is an exercise, a little, just a little one, not like homework, it's different, okay? It gives you a verse that you can read that's from the Bible, and it, um, it'll have games in it to do, okay? And then you complete it. And if you need help, you can ask your brothers or your sisters, or your mom or dad to help you, that's fine. But use it, try to make a special part of each day to, to do, have a quiet time to get to know God better, okay? And then you can bring it back, and we'll be so happy to see your, how you did your quiet time, and we'll probably give you extra points for your team. Won't that be fun? And you'll get to know God more. So remember, okay, don't leave without your quiet time today, and bring it back, and you really enjoy getting to know God's word. Let's pray right now and let's thank God for his word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Bible that you've given us, Lord. I think that's something we can hold on to and look at and read and learn how you brought Jesus, your son, here to earth, okay, through the promises you've given us, Lord. And also, Lord, just getting to know him all the more is such a blessing through your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
everybody should know what a superhero is, right? All right, I want somebody to tell me what their favorite superhero is. Yes, Spider-Man. Oh my goodness, what's another one? Yes, Wonder Woman. Okay, one more. What's your favorite superhero? One more. Yes. Iron Man, yes. Those are all really cool superheroes. And they all have something in common, right? They all have great strength and power. Well, today in our song, we're going to talk about someone who is all powerful, and that is God. In this song, it's called God's Power. And I'm going to sing it for you, and then we'll talk about what it means. So it goes like this. My God is bigger than I am. Strongest of all, he is able to make the summer turn into fall. He controls all that happens, his power is plain to see. And I know I can trust him, for with his power he cares for me. God speaks to me in the Bible shows me his love he tells how the lord jesus came to earth from above he tells how i can please him and teaches me his ways yes the bible will guide me and give me strength for all my days so this song in the very beginning it's talking about that God is greater and bigger than anything else, even than all, bigger than all those superheroes that you named. He says that he is the strongest of all. He is able to create all the different seasons. He is able to make them change. And he has power over the storms and sea. He has power over everything. If you have believed in Jesus, God wants you to know that he is always in control. And if you have not believed in Jesus, you can believe in him today. So let's stand up and let's sing this song that we do going to sing without the music. Okay. Okay. We'll sing it together. Okay? Everybody will sing. Okay? All right. My God is bigger than I am, strongest of all. He is able to make the summer turn into fall. He controls all that happens. His power is plain to see. And I know I can trust him, for with his power he cares for me. God speaks to me in the Bible, shows me his love. He tells how the Lord Jesus came to earth from above. He tells how I can please him and teaches me his ways. Yes, the Bible will guide me and give me strength for all my days. And let's say this verse together. It's Psalms 147.5. Great is our Lord and of great power. Psalm 147.5. Very good. Tell us about the time you were almost eaten by cannibals, Grandfather. Or the time you had, had to hide up in a tree all night. Or what about the time the man pretended to be sick and then tried to attack you with a knife? John Payton looked into the eager faces of his two children. He certainly did have plenty of stories he could share that with them about his time as a missionary to the island of Vanuatu. But there was another story he wanted to share. Through all that had happened over the many years, there was one place he remembered most, one voice it seemed as if he could still hear. Good night, children. 
I want to start by telling you about someone whose story deserves to be told much more than mine, my father's. I was born into my father's house in 1824 as the oldest of five sons and six daughters. Our home was a place in Turawad, Scotland. The house was made of heavy oak wood, stones, and a roof of wood, and strong grasses woven together tightly. It was not a fancy place because my father, James Patton, Peyton, did not have much money. Inside the house, there was one big room where my mother worked. The room was our dining room, our kitchen, our living room, and bedroom all in one. The other room was my father's workshop and ours as well. We all worked together on big wooden machines to weave socks to sell to the storekeepers. Between those two rooms was the other tiny space that we called the closet. This was a special time, a place where my father would go to pray. After each meal was over, he would go into the closet and shut the door. All of us children always tiptoed by so we wouldn't disturb him. Sometimes we could hear the sound of his voice as he talked to God. What did he talk about? Oh, many, many things. But what I remember especially is that he prayed for me and my brothers and sisters. He prayed that we would know God and love him. Uh, of course, I knew my father loved God because he talked to him so much. That's why he always had a smile on his face. The children had seen that same smile on their grandfather's face too. But my father didn't always pray by himself. Every morning and every evening, we would gather our whole family together and all would pray and read God's word, the Bible. There wasn't anything that could make him forget to do this. One thing I especially remember is that he would get down on his knees and ask God to help all the people in faraway parts of the world who had never heard about Jesus to have a way to learn about him. Like the people in the islands where you went as a missionary? Yes, and sometimes my father would cry when he prayed. God used those prayers in my heart to make me want to go and tell those people about Jesus. And boys and girls, next week, I hope we find out just how God uses John Payton for his glory. All right, now it is my favorite part of club, review game time. Are you guys ready? Okay, so what we are going to play is a game, a little game I like to call tic-tac-toe. Have ever, has everyone heard of tic-tac-toe? Raise your hand. Okay, good, so no explanation further needed, okay. Um, so what I will do is I will split you up into two teams, X's and O's, of course, and I will ask you one question per team, and if you get the question right, you get to come up here, and you will be either the X or O, and you're gonna choose your spot on the tic-tac-toe board. All right, and you're gonna make an X or an O for your team with your fingers, or, okay? Does everybody understand? Okay, so we're gonna split it right down the middle here, and I want Jessica to go on that side. Very good, yes. So I'm gonna let this side decide. What would you guys like to be, X's or O's? X's, okay. You guys are X's, you guys are O's, all right? So we're gonna start with the O's, since you guys got to decide if you wanted to be X's. All right, so are you guys listening? First question, what is, let's see here. What makes God different from everybody else? I saw your hand first. He's whole, right. He's perfect. Very good. All right, come on up, Esther. Now, come and choose your spot. You're an O, right? Come and choose your spot. Oh, the very middle. Okay, so the middle spot is taken. All right, so who were the first two people created? Oh my goodness, I saw Jessica's hand really fast. Adam and Eve, very good, yes. Come on up, come choose your spot. Oh, very good, right in the front there. Okay, 
All right, O's. Okay. What is something that God created? Yes. What did God create? The earth. Very good. And what was his most special creation out of all the things in the earth? Us. Very good. Come on up. You're an O. Come choose your spot. There's an O in the middle. Oh, we've got two in a row here. All right, X's. Let's see if you can block them. All right. So, what does our verse, John 3.16, tell us about God? What does it tell us about God? Yes. He loves the world. Very good. Come on up. All right, we've got O's, show yourselves, O's, and we got an X. Oh, okay, he blocked you guys. Okay, let's see if we can get three in a row, hopefully. All right, let's see here. What changed God's perfect creation? What changed it completely? Sin. Sin, very good. Come on up, quickly. Choose a spot. All right, we've got X's. X, X, X. All right. Okay. All right, X's. All right. Let's see here. What was God's plan to fix the problem of sin in our lives? What was God's plan? Yes. Who did? Jesus. Very good. Come on up. Did we get three in a row? Yes! All right. Good job, X's. All right. You guys can go sit back down. All right. The X's won, so let's give a round of applause for the X's. Very good. Good job. All right. Okay, boys and girls, did you enjoy today? Did you have fun? It was fun, wasn't it? I enjoyed it. And I learned so much. Man, I learned so much today. Did you learn a few things? Yeah. Good. Good. Next week, are you going to come back? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. How about inviting a friend? Would you like a friend to have sit here with you and enjoy it and have fun together? Well, when you leave here today, go to your table, your shepherd's table, talk to your shepherd, and ask them for a registration form. Now, you will also get, as you leave today, a little baggie full, got a piece of candy in it, but wait till you get to your car before you open the candy, because I don't want to see rappers around the school, okay? But also in that little bag is your memory verse for today, John 3.16, and also that quiet time book that Miss Marshall was talking about where you can spend uh, every day next week, or this week, in reading about God and doing some topics. But do one section a day. Don't do the whole thing in one day. But do a section a day. If you're having trouble with it, ask your mom or dad, maybe your brother or sister, to help you. And then there's also a page to color. And this page represents Street in heaven and what God is preparing for us uh, in our stored Bible lessons for you today. So, if you also come for the next six weeks, our next seven weeks, we're going to have a wonder book for you. Take home so you can spend more time with God. One page a day, spending time with God. We can never spend enough time with Him. And He wants to spend time with you. Because word up, God loves me. That's correct. Never forget, God loves me. And let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you again for the privilege we have to be able to go into the schools, to be able to, to, to be your representative, to be your herald, uh, to pronounce uh, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, many have never heard it. Lord, some have, but don't understand. Some have, but don't, oh, they don't know how to go any further. Lord, help us be the vehicle 
to teach them by your word. And we thank you for it. It's not for our glory, but for yours. Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Question. Okay. Um, what activities were included in the club hour, and how did the teachers keep the club moving from one activity to another? What were the different parts of the good news club? What's that? Unknown. So from song. Okay. Um, yes, that kept it. That kept the one session to the next. Did it? Okay. And. I asked Tom not to use the music for that last song we did um, because I wanted to sort of a, a little bit of experiment in mind. When we use the music, you don't sing. You know that? You didn't sing. Okay? And it's the same with the children, too. Okay? I, I really recommend, okay, uh, in the curriculum there will be a CD of the songs. Okay? And then you also find them on our website. Um, I highly recommend to whoever your song person, or if you have a couple of song persons, for them to learn the song, teach the song without the music. If you want your kids to, I see this over and over again in Good News Club, okay? If you want your kids to sing at Good News Club, don't use the music. Learn the song. And that way, if there's any, like, Type of music, like I agree, sometimes I don't like over music. Okay? I don't like from the tempo or whatever. You can make it your own that way. Okay? So I, I recommend, I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying if you want your kids to sing in the club, okay, and just not listen to the music and just put stand there, then don't do music. Okay? And that's how it was originally talked about music. Okay, um, right, okay, you said song. Hopefully you heard something else other than songs as well. Yes. Okay, that's very, very important of a good news club. Did you see the, how the different activities and the one new time and how it all build up to that Bible lesson? Was the message of salvation part of the Bible? It was. Did she, did she stop the narrative and then teach the, the gospel and go on? It was woven, wasn't it? And uh, what about the second verse? Did you hear the I care? Did you notice the I care as a part of the message? <coughs> I actually, I should have repeated the verse a couple more times this year than I did. You want to repeat that at least six to eight times. In the, in the memory verse. So that use terminology that the children would understand. And let's see. Um, and of course, it reinforced the main teachings of Jesus. How were the children, oh, we always mention this, what other ways were the children kept involved? Word up, yes. That's a tool. That is a tool. If you see the kids just go to not listening, okay? What they, if you see the kids not listening, check yourself. Are you using um, voice inflection? Okay? Are you using, uh, are you not just roll? Um, you know, are you making it, doing it, presenting in a way that it's enjoyable to the children if they want to listen? Okay? But also sometimes with this topic, you're getting them at the end of the day. Okay, so that word app really helps draw them back in to, to the club. Okay. So uh, I hope you enjoy the club, and I know you're going to enjoy um, <coughs> doing this work for the children and, and for your church. Any questions? So, okay. We, we have a little something for you. Um, past four or five years, um, 
we started uh, our chapter, the Blues chapter, has started uh, making ornaments uh, for the, each child in all of our goodness books. This year we made something like a, we made close to a thousand, okay, ornaments. And this year it's, uh, it's a simple little ornament. It's a picture of baby Jesus on it. And it says, Jesus left heaven for, and then it's a question mark. Okay? And then in parentheses it says, turn ornament over. You turn it over, and then you peel off the film that's on the back side, and there's a mirror. Because Jesus left heaven for each of them. Okay. So I hope I'll to you. And uh, next year, I don't know what we'll do if you have any suggestions for me. It just has to be easy and nice and cheap. <laughs> and have a message, a good message on it. I greatly appreciate that. And try to do something different every year. So, um, okay. So now we need to interview with Doug. Okay. And there's going to be one, two, three, four of us to do. This is three questions. A couple of you have already completed them. And then once you're completed, you can come up. It's very important that we get this done and that they're Pastor, do you have any parting words? Nothing? <laughs> I will leave everything set up they're having Christmas fun here this evening, so they just have laid the chairs. I know it's a great thing to think about Christmas time. But I just want to stay here and help the fellow man here. Is everybody here like it? a little bit overwhelmed, you say, well, wait a minute, what if I forget some things? Where would you go to get help? So if you'd like to talk to you, that would be at uh, blueridgecf.org. Go to the team member page, the tab, team member, it's the one you were at when you did your background check, but they'll have something called demos. And in the demos will be all the Bible lessons for uh, your, uh, the wordless book, and all the other ones, but the wordless book. All the songs are there. If you go pick up the songs, the alphabetical listing, or if you don't know what it is, you type it, uh, the, the uh, song you want, up in the right hand search column, the search area, and it will take you right to it. If you have any questions, or problems, concerns, call Stan. No. <laughs> Feel free to write to us or call us. Uh, that's what we're here for to serve you. Okay? So, interviews we need to do.
Gonna be around a few more minutes.